one us in half a day. And thank you everyone for being here today. Today is Tuesday, May 11th, 2021. And it is currently 11.03 a.m. For the record and in accordance with the open government's law, public notices were sent via email to all senators, stakeholders, and all main media broadcasting outlets on Tuesday, May 4, 2021, and on Friday, May 7, 2021. Joining me today is Senator Shelton, the Vice Chair of Education. Thank you, Senator, for being here. Before we proceed, the legislature has general rules of conduct that must be followed. Individuals testifying shall, shall first be recognized by the chair before speaking and shall state their name for record keeping purposes. We will allow the superintendent first to give testimony and uh, we'll go by his lead on what members will be speaking at that time. After the testimony is completed, we will move forward with the questions from the panel. Questions and testimony shall be confined to the substance or nature of the agenda, personal inference as to the character or the motive of any senator or any individual testifying is not permitted. Any violations of this general rule will, con will result in removal from the hearing by the host. Okay. Half a day and good morning everyone. For today's informational hearing, we will be discussing the Guam Department of Education's plan for how schools' curriculums determine the type of text and media are appropriate for student use in classrooms. As a regard, there were concerns from local stakeholders that were brought to our attention in regards to, a, to curriculum conducted within the classrooms. Secondly, we will also discuss the status on dissemination of American Rescue Plan, outlying areas, funds to the schools, the project narrative and budget narrative, and how the federal funds will be utilized to address capital improvement projects amongst GDOE schools. We will also discuss the challenges and the appropriations for the ESF SCA funds that have been received. I would now like to invite the superintendent, oh, forgive me, I would like to acknowledge the superintendent uh, Mr. John Fernandez for his, his presence here today, uh, Mr. Mendiola, for, uh, who is the chair of the Guam Education Board, Ms. Zinni Asuncion, who is the CFO for Guam Department of Education, and Mr. Ike Santos, who runs the federal programs, and Mr. Joseph Sanchez, who runs our curriculum section of Guam Department of Education. Mr. Superintendent, please proceed. Half a day, good morning, um, and thank you Chairwoman Nelson and Senator Shelton for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, you do have a copy of our, our brief uh, testimony, um, and uh, thank you also for uh, doing the introductions for the team too. I'm glad, <laughs> I know you're familiar with all of them, so it really saved me some the opportunity. Before I get started, though, if, if you don't mind, I'd like um, to, me to give our board chair an opportunity to, to, to say a few remarks before we open up. Hafidi Centers, Uncle Nesizus Masi, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I'm just here in support of our team. Uh, there's a lot of work that's being done at the Department of Education. And uh, thank you for those thoughtful questions. And we have our responses prepared. And, and we um, look forward to the dialogue between uh, you and, the, uh, and our department. Uh, I'm pretty sure there's going to be a lot of people um, tuning in to hear what the Department of Education has been doing. We've been meeting consistently. Our meetings are always open, but this also gives us another opportunity to meet with you, some of our key stakeholders and partners. And so I uh, appreciate the time to dialogue with uh, the legislature. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Mendiola. So uh, as I proceed, I'm, I came prepared to uh, read the testimony. I, there were three items that were referenced in the public notice. And of course, we prepare a response. So I, I can either go item by item, or did you, if you wanted to go through the entire testimony and then go to questions, I'm happy to follow your lead. Yes, can you please just uh, uh, present okay. your entire testimony, and then we will follow with questions if there are any. Thank okay. you, Mr. Superintendent. All right, thank you. So um, again, I also want to echo the chair's remarks, and thank you for the opportunity uh, today. The days are flying, and uh, you know, I mean, especially during this pandemic year, and so I know that there's always a need for communication and 
we're always open to, to make that time available, knowing that it always seems like the time is just passing us by. And we do want you to be updated on what things are happening and then also use this opportunity to update the public uh, just in another form and another, um, you know, another audience that, that um, you know, may, need, may need and can use the information today. So item number one, um, Madam Chair, you, you mentioned a concern from the stakeholders. Thank you for bringing that to my attention, the specific complaint, but also the general question so that if any other parents have uh, questions or concerns, they can also be informed. The question was, how are the schools determining what types of text and media are appropriate for utilizing in the classroom? So the Guam Department of Education selects textbooks for all grade levels and content areas based on board policy 602, which is attached uh, to this to my submission, which outlines, outlines the process for textbook adoption. The Joint Board Union Committee on Textbook Adoption provides an opportunity for representatives of the Guam Education Board and Management and the Guam Federation of Teachers to participate in the assessment and selection of the appropriate textbooks based on alignment with district content standards uh, and performance indicators. In the classroom, GDOE is guided by Board Policy 378, which requires teachers to incorporate use of the textbooks and other instructional resources into their daily lesson plans. These lesson plans should also be in alignment with district standards and performance indicators, um, and school administrators are responsible for working with the teachers to ensure compliance with the board policy. So essentially, um, while there is guidance uh, provided at the district level in terms of the, um, the standards, in terms of the performance indicators, in terms of the vision and mission of the department, a lot of the, um, you know, in addition to the textbooks, the, the other introduction of other uh, resources, including other media and other texts, really happens at the school level between the teachers, uh, between the teachers amongst themselves, you know, within their content area or within their grade level, uh, and then the administrator's responsibility is to ensure that there is compliance uh, in the selection of those materials for, you know, with board policy. So should there be any concerns that arise about a lesson plan uh, that was used in the classroom on any given day, we do want parents to feel free and to, to address those questions or concerns directly with that teacher, uh, just to ensure uh, there is a full explanation and maybe additional information that might be provided. And if they're not satisfied uh, with the school administrator, and I think for the most part, we, we hope that that, you know, that level of conversation will clarify you know, the, um, you know, what's being taught uh, what, le what the lessons are and, and, and what the kids are exposed to in the classroom. In the particular incident that you brought to my attention, Senator Nelson, uh, we did address it with the principal and the principal did address it with the, the uh, teachers in that content area at, the, at, the, at their school. Um, while they did have an explanation for the use of those materials, they did understand the concern and I uh, wanted to ensure uh, at the school level that there was more transparency with the parents, more communication with the parents with regard to materials that are gonna be discussed in the classroom uh, through either in it, uh, making sure that these are included in the syllabus and then opportunities to discuss with parents uh, prior to those classes taking place. So I think in the incident you referenced, it was online. So you know, that of course complicates you know, sometimes the interaction because um, you know, it's different when it's in class and there might be a fuller context. Um, but in this case, I do, I do have confidence that the principal has addressed it and that the teachers are, are you know, well aware of the concerns and are looking to make sure that uh, they address that proactively in the future. Item number two has to do with federal fundings and the question was uh, regarding the status on dissemination of American Rescue Plan outlying areas funds to the schools. So um, as you mentioned, Mr. Ike Santos is here on behalf of the federal programs office uh, also, Deputy Superintendent Joe Sanchez is also here, and, and his, his, his office really handles uh, many of the projects and activities uh, that are being supported by the federal funds, and he's been helping to coordinate the planning, not just for the ARP, but also for the ESF, uh, the two rounds of ESF funding that has come uh, to the department uh, since last year. So the federal program's office has already conducted the ARP uh, stakeholder consultative and technical assistance workshops for all eligible public charter and private non nonprofit educational institutions. Currently, uh, the SEA is working with institutions that have opted to participate through a series of draft proposals, feedback sessions, and revised submissions. 
and all the educational institutions continue to assess their needs, gather stakeholder input and com to, in order to complete the application templates. So in short, we're not done yet with the uh, proposed budget and plan for the ARP. Uh, to date, the first draft proposal submission and feedback session has been completed. A second draft was due yesterday and a final draft is due May 14th, 2021. And at that point, we will have um, a finalized application to USDOE uh, with a target date of May 21st, 2021. So uh, again, ARP, we're talking about $287 million that is to be shared, um, as, you, as, you, as you're familiar with, not just with GDOE public schools, but with charter schools and with uh, the private schools. And so we are still in the process of putting that budget proposal together based on the input and the consultation with all parties involved. So by May 21st, we should have a uh, final um, budget proposal that will be sent to you as DOE. And we, of course, uh, would be happy to share uh, that information uh, with the legislature as, as well as, as other stakeholders. Our board will also be apprised as well uh, when, that, when we get to that point. Uh, you'll see in your in your uh, packet, there is an, an updated grant status report for information related to the encumbrances and expenditures for both ESF SCA, which was the first round, and then ESF II, uh, the first round being $41.5 million, and then ESF II, which is $110.5 million, uh, $110.5 million, and then uh, so notably as it relates to the ESF I, 96% of the $41.5 million has either been entered in requisition encumbered or expended. So most of those funds are already accounted for. Uh, we recently completed the budget for ESF2 and are now in the process of beginning to encumber and execute those uh, dollar amounts. And we can talk more about what's in, those, what's in that grant as well. So as it relates to uh, ESF2, all educational institutions are continuing to enter requisitions, uh, which be initiates the process for getting the supplies, equipment, and, and services needed. Um, one of the issues that has come up was uh, in, our, in ESF2, uh, we, uh, we, we did get a lot of requests for support for CIP projects, so capital improvement projects, um, not just for DOE traditional schools, but for our private schools, our charter schools. Uh, however, they are now in the process of amending their application as, based on guidance that we received from USDOE, which specifies that uh, capital improvement projects for non-government of Guam facilities is, a, is not allowed, is an unallowable use of funds. So um, there is an amendment process going on to reallocate those resources that have been set aside for the private and the charter schools. And uh, approximately 70, approximately 78 percent of the total funding is still available, and uh, for the DOE public school district, a large majority of those funds is for CIP work, uh, aimed to prevent, prepare, and respond for uh, COVID-19. And we are now uh, in the process of of uh, issuing a, a RFP for construction management services to oversee the completion of all the planned uh, CIP projects. The DOE EF, ESF2 CIP listing includes, among many other things, I mean, this is not the exhaustive list, but these are the major items, uh, infrastructure retrofit for electrical upgrades, internet upgrades, including firewalls, network switches, content filters, network monitoring, water filtration systems, retrofit of portable hand washing stations, retrofit of filtered water bottle filling stations, the restroom repairs and plumbing slew sewer upgrades, walkway awnings and canopy repairs, uh, energy efficient HVAC systems of UV lighting and electrical retrofit and upgrades, and then addressing uh, other deferred maintenance and facilities issues as identified under US DOI and the US Army Corps uh, work. The uh, Federal Programs Division has provided guidance to uh, the DOE public schools that capital improvement projects are to focus on the return of students to face-to-face -face models of learning. Uh, the application inclusive of these, of these activities our pending submission of the final proposal and further review before application can be deemed acceptable and approvable. So I, I mean, in summary, again, I think part of this question has to do with whether or not we will be able to use these funds uh, to support uh, major facility improvements within our school system. And the answer 
for the DOE public schools is yes. And we are working very hard, of course, within the allowable uses of the funds to be able to dedicate funding to support those facility uh, upgrades and, and repairs. What we just went through in terms of the bullet points has to do with ESF2. Now with the ARP, we're actually building on, you know, and looking and expanding the scope uh, of, of the CIP projects that can be, can be done. So uh, we will, we will uh, hope to see uh, many of those CIP projects um, being funded. And again, I think as I mentioned to you, we've always come to the, to the legislature stressing the need for CIP investment. So this is actually, um, I don't know, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna say, I wanna say once in a lifetime <laughs> because it's, it's, it's taken a pandemic to really produce some of these resources, but we do wanna be able to use these resources to address some of those longstanding needs that we've come to you with and we will, we will be happy to share, you know, what we were able to fund uh, with these funds uh, once we are completed, once the application is completed, uh, again, uh, towards the end of May. And then item number three, I think um, the question was having to do with really understanding the nature of the delay behind the Wi-Fi devices for the PATH program um, that were funded by the ESF SEA funds. So uh, first I wanted to clarify this because it was, it adds, it kind of adds to the complications, but the the funding is actually not provided by the SEA funds, but provided by the ESF funding allocated to the governor. So in ESF-1, the governor received $12 million um, to be able to use for educational purposes. So during the summer of last year, DOE focused on allocating the SEA funding uh, to address the immediate health and safety needs for students and employees and to support the shift to distance learning. Uh, but we also participated in regular discussions with the Lieutenant Governor and his staff regarding our plans because I think they wanted to make sure that their plans didn't, uh, you know, weren't redundant and didn't conflict with our plans. So I, I, at, at some point they decided they would like to use their funds, uh, about $8.9 million to support internet access at home, which was not being covered by DOE. And that, prop that proposal was submitted to G US DOE uh, in ar around mid-August um, of, of 2020. And again, that was $8.9 million that was agreed to be sub-granted to DOE to administer a home internet access program for students. Um, it's my recollection, I, I, didn't, I wasn't able to pull this specific information, but it's my recollection that final approval uh, by US DOE of the governor's proposal did not happen until late October, early November. Uh, we were constantly checking in. Uh, we needed that USDOE approval before we moved, you know, the project forward. So once that happened, uh, again in August, um, you know, we were, we, we really um, took the primary lead for this project in October, and that's when the design, uh, the design phase, so I was, we were waiting for the USDOE approval. Uh, design of the program took place primarily in October and part of November. Um, as we waited for USDOE's confirmation. By late November, we were circulating and reviewing a memorandum of agreement with the Office of the Governor. Uh, this MOA was needed uh, in order to document the subgranting of the ESF funds to GDOE and also to serve, that document would end up serving as the verification of funding availability that was required for us to commence procurement. So we did sign, I signed off on the MOA and it was returned to the governor's office on December 15th. And I, it was my understanding that the governor's office then sent that MOA to the attorney general for his review shortly thereafter. Uh, the final MOA shows that the attorney general signed off on January 26, 2021. And the governor then executed the MOA officially on January 28th, 2021. And it's with that execution of the MOA that we were able to formally begin the procurement process. Um, we issued an indefinite quantity bid solicitation uh, in early February and provided three weeks for vendors to submit their bids. The initial deadline for submission was February 22nd, 2021. Subsequently, this deadline was amended uh, to February 25th, 2021. Upon receipt of the bids uh, on that date, GDOE then evaluated the submissions and issued a notice of intent to award on March 11th, 2021. Uh, GDOE was then required by procurement regulations to wait for 15 days before issuing the final award and purchase order 
um, for those service for the um, the um, equipment. So we waited the, the 15 days and immediately thereafter, the purchase order was cut on March 30th, 2021. And DOE then worked with the vendor to organize the, the distribution of devices. We, were, we publicly announced the award on April 1st, uh, which identified IT&E as the winning vendor. And since then, uh, we, we've, uh, been set, we've set up with the mayor's numerous distribution points and time frames, and we've been able to distribute over 2,000 MiFi devices uh, at this point in time. So with that, uh, thank you again for the opportunity to provide responses to your questions, uh, and we're, we stand by ready to provide any additional information that might be needed. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Superintendent. One of the main concerns, and, and thank you for the explanation of the the Wi-Fi devices, the, the MiFi devices. Mm -hmm. um, there was concerns that it took a long, uh, a long time for GDOE to get the MiFi devices out to our stakeholders, but I appreciate that you provided a timeline to show where the role you played, or Guam Department of Education played in the execution of this matter, and that the sole responsibility and the money was with the uh, governor's office, so you, ca you had to wait for the approval with USDOE. So I appreciate that because that has been an ongoing statement that I come across. It took one year for GDOE to get MiFi devices, you know, and there, a lot of the stakeholders are, were upset about it, that it came so late, but thank you for the description of the timeline. I do have a question, the, um, the ESF-1, now that you have utilized 96% of the 41.5 million, what is still pending? I, I, let me, I'm going to go ahead and ask Mr. Ike uh, Santos okay. who produces this report. Thank you. Hafide, Ike Santos, Federal Programs Division Administrator. Uh, pretty much everything has been obligated uh, other than the 4%. I believe the 4% had to do with uh, the salaries of those individuals that have worked in um, administering the grant and implementing the activities. That needs to be uh, JV'd out because local funds paid for, I haven't yet been paid or I have been paid, that needs to be JV'd so that that will be zeroed out. We're now focusing on ESF2. So basically ESF1, everything has been spoken for uh, uh, with the expenditures and uh, please make note that uh, we amended it three times the ESF-1 with the U.S. Department of Education to reflect uh, some of the services that were not included in the ESF-1 application to U.S. Ed. One included a box truck. Uh, if you ever go to the GDOE uh, conference room, it's filled with PPE supplies and materials head to toe from one end to the other uh, to include um, uh, jacks and a, uh, a truck so that we can uh, deliver those service, I mean those PPE supplies materials to both the public schools 41, the 13 Catholic schools, the seven private non-public schools and the three charter schools. So I mean uh, pretty much all funds for ESF1 have been spoken for. Thank you. And are all the obligated funds for what you are utilizing the ESF-1 to purchase or to um, contract, are all of those projects or items completed, the invoices and the contracts completed and closed? Uh, and many of them are still ongoing. Okay. And so as, it, as the items are or the um, projects are completed, for the public schools, it would go through a scrutiny of project leads, actually school administrators, project leads, and then Mr. Sanchez will certify that the services were completed. Then it will go to my office. My office will go out to the school sites to make sure that if they put a water filling station for this location, it's actually there, only to find out that we have issues with that, and that is, although the water bottle filling station is there, there's no electrical connection. So we had to go back to the vendor and saying this is unacceptable. They're saying that they're working on it. I said, you cannot bill us until everything is complete. Okay. So that's what's ongoing right now with ESF-1. Okay, and then for ESF-2, I, I appreciate the list of uh, priorities that you have here because the 
accessibility to the clean restrooms and also water fountains, there has been some concern within the community that the restrooms are in dire need of renovation and also that the water fountains are old and decaying and so the, the children are drinking, in a sense, high mineral water. Um, in, in some cases, it's discolored. And so are we looking at providing all schools with this, this retrofit of the renovation of our restrooms and also our water fountains and water, water bottle filling stations? My understanding is that the uh, water fountains have been closed as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic situation and they are being converted to uh, hands-free water bottle filling stations. We did as much as we could with ESF-1. Now we're trying to increase the numbers, actually triple the numbers on ESF-2. And then ESF-3, again, will do likewise. But it's all contingent on the district to make that recommendation as to what their needs are. The funding is there. It's allowable. It's reasonable and allocable. We're just waiting for the ARP uh, OASEA proposal to be submitted to our office for complete review. Okay, thank you. I, I'd like to transition now into the ARP funding. Is there an anticipated timeline when the funding will arrive and will it arrive in a lump sum? The, the funds are here. It's okay. just, it's a matter of setting up the account, but we cannot set up the account until all institutions submit their proposal and our office reviews the proposal. And then once we de deem that it's allowable and approvable, we will transmit all of that to the U.S. Department of Education, and then key players will have to sign assurances that their funds will be used accordingly and the accounts will be set up for immediate expenditure. But the funds are here. It's a matter of now asking the public schools, the 14, 13 Catholic schools, the seven private non-public and the three charter schools, how do you wish to expend those funds? And there, we're working with the respective institutions to ensure that it's allowable, reasonable, and allocable. So this, the institutions that are authorized to receive the funds is, are basically all funds, uh, all the schools in Guam, public and private and charter? Uh, correction, uh, none of the institutions receive funds, they receive services. All oh, the services. And the services equate to an equitable amount based on number of students enrolled from the previous year. Okay. And it is based on needs, and so it's really scrutinized. I mean, there was an issue in the ESF too. One private school wanted a coffee a mocha machine, and we're saying, oh no, that's not allowed. Uh, another one wanted a um, mist so that people can calm their nerves. I said, oh no, that's not allowed. And so it really is scrutinized to the T to ensuring that what is being requested for would address the grant requirements. Okay. And for the... So ma'am, just, just quick, I mean, so quick clarification, yes. Um, so by May 21st, uh, that's when we anticipate getting all of the proposals and budget uh, settled so that there can be a final review. So uh, hopefully shortly thereafter, we can confirm uh, that that's been put to, put to bed. And of course, of course just, uh, just for clarification for the general public, the Dodea schools are not included, so they're gonna have their own separate uh, access to support. So it is just our public, uh, traditional schools, our charter schools, and our private schools, uh, not including Dodea, though. Okay. That, that's correct. In addition, our, all the application that we transmitted officially to the U.S. Department of Education that was concurred by the superintendent are on the GDOE federal program's website. In addition, we are required to report anything over 30000 in expenditures under the FAFADA requirements, a federal requirement that we must be able to report for transparency. Thank you, Mr. Santos. And for the ARP, do you, is there a plan on what the ARP will be utilized for? Uh, we're just waiting for that, Senator, yeah. for that proposal from the district. Okay. So, so I, I think uh, with with the you know with the with the three rounds of funding, I think I've kind of described it this way that of course round one was our immediate response, so a lot of focus on the health and safety supplies and equipment that we needed, plus the shift to, to distance learning, which required the technology and you know, di the instructional materials. And that was for 42 million. Now, we, as we moved into uh, round two, 
what we wanted to do was complete a lot of those, you know, we, we, we could only go so far, so you, we invested in further technology, ensured the constant stream of uh, PPEs and so forth that we anticipated would be used. Um, and now we're looking, you know, like we wanted to use those funds now to kind of focus in on the return. So we responded, you know, a lot of shutdowns across the country. Now we were looking at returning. So the question was, what do we need to do to ensure that our facilities are safe so we can manage that return? So that's when you're seeing the focus on ventilation, on canopies, on fill, you know, water bottle filling stations. So with ESF, you know, two, we want to, you know, fulfill that initial investment and, and focus a lot on return to the school facilities. So with this round three, um, I think what we're looking at is how to sustain that. So there is, uh, there is a requirement that a minimum of 20% be used to address the learning you know, recovery, right? So there's, a, there's a, an expectation that the impact of COVID-19 has significantly uh, negatively impacted teaching and learning and, and students' academic progress. We're not gonna really know that until they come back to school. So we really want our kids back to face-to-face -to -face instruction. But uh, once we do, uh, at least 20% of the ARP has to be dedicated to addressing you know, those, those needs. So those will be in the classroom uh, for, uh, to address learning recovery. Outside of that, our expectation was that we would continue to invest those funds, like you, you, know, like you mentioned, in CIP projects that help our school facilities um, maintain and sustain a safe environment going forward. And so I think you can expect to see a significant allocation towards CIP funding uh, projects in our budget. And I think I mentioned the, I mentioned the slight uh, um, you know, issue that we have to deal with is that you know, even though DOE public schools are investing in CIP, there are limitations as to what the charter and the private schools are able to do so I know that they're going through their review process to ensure that it's compliant with USDOE guidance. And essentially that guidance is that, you know, if you're gonna invest in, in CIP projects, in, in, in projects that uh, result in permanent uh, or long-term, you know, um, uh, repairs or renovations of a facility, those have to be facilities that belong to the government and, uh, and to the state, actually. And so, uh, for those private schools, that's a big, you know, obviously a big issue and challenge. So we've clarified that several times. That it's been a question that we've received from our private school partners, uh, and we went to USDOE to make sure we clarified that and received it in writing, so we could, um, you know, be clear to the, our partners about what the rules are. Okay, and what is the amount in dollars that each uh, district or uh, category yeah. for public, private? and uh, charter schools, what is the amount of dollars in the ARP will they receive? You said it was a, based on their allocation of, of students, the enrollment, but what is that amount? Um, Senator, it, it's again based on enrollment and then the intent to participate. In the ARP uh, uh, outlying area for SCA, uh, we did an, uh, uh, in a estimate of number of students participating okay. uh, for participating institutions only to find out just the other day four institutions opted not to participate. And so they have to sign intent to participate or intent not to participate. If they do decide not to participate, those monies get reallocated to all the institutions. So that's being worked on right now. Okay, so, it's uh, been so it just depends, again, at the end, based on needs and not wants. But I just want to make note that the, what the superintendent noted, 20% of the American Rescue Plan for outlying areas, state education agency must be used for scientifically evidence research-based practice that deals with learning loss. So in that application, they must come right up front and tell us 20% of this, and they must tell us what that scientifically evidence research-based. I do know that we've been working with the Catholic schools. Uh, Joe has met with the superintendent of Catholic schools to address those requirements. And what it is is just basically practices that we actually have within the Guam DOE district as well as the charter schools and, and the, uh, the Catholic schools, such as classroom instructions that work, PSYOP, direct instruction, et cetera. Those are just one of th many different uh, scientifically evidence research based. They just need to tell us what that uh, research based practice will be used uh, as a result of the ARP for uh, learning loss. So that's one of the things that we'll be working with. 
but the district has been working and Joe can expound further. Joe? And we're looking at the timeline of submission in May? Uh, they May, 20, uh, May 14th and then our office reviews everything. We have to look at to determine whether what that scientific evidence research based activity is and ensure that it meets the requirements of the U.S. Department of Education and then it goes one step further. It's not just right, you're getting it, it's the implementation exactly. as well as the fidelity as right. well as uh, um, uh, um, measurable objectives so that it can be achieved to ensure that quarterly reports are submitted so that we can see is it really working. Okay. And then for the, um, for the 14 points mandate, we received a, a draft uh, appropriation request from the board and it covers certain areas. One of the items is item six, which is the air conditioned or pro properly ventilated classrooms. Are, are you looking at dedicating this ARP money to assist in, this, in the resolution of this issue? Uh, uh, we hope so, you know, but it's up me, to the district to make yeah, that recommendation. So, We're so talking the answer about is, GDOE. Yeah, so the answer is yes. Um, as part of the ESF2, we did include um, the, you know, looking at both the HVAC units, um, be, being able to support uh, HVAC units with, that are also, uh, you know, energy efficient and enhanced with UV lighting and so forth as one strategy. We also uh, have set aside resources for standalone uh, portable uh, uh, filters, HEPA filters that can also be used. So we're looking at it almost like a phased approach to do, do what we need to do immediately to uh, address the filtration in the classrooms. And then, uh, you know, with um, the, fu the funding for new units, we'll be able, you know, we want to implement that as well. I think our, we've been talking about the, you know, the three priorities in terms of our return to school. And, you know, one, number one, of course, uh, this is, you know, from our conversation with public health, making sure that we maintain our, you know, our masking requirement. Uh, number two, that we promote our vaccination amongst our employees and our students as they become eligible. And I think, you know, three, ventilation is really critical. So that's, easy, even as of yesterday, a very uh, urgent discussions to make sure that we address this and find a way to expedite um, the portable filters as well as what's needed to do long-term uh, repair and replacement of the stand, you know, the HVAC units that are already installed or in need of uh, full replacement. So, I, so again, ESF2 will be part of that support and if needed, ARP will also provide uh, resources in that direction as well. Okay, and then the $17 million for the uh, textbooks required and workbooks, are we able to use any of the federal grants to purchase these items? You want to? So I, what I what I what I can say is that we are using you are using the uh, ESF funds to invest in a, in a lot of instructional materials that include both hard copy, soft copy, and and electronic uh, instructional materials. So uh, what the board has asked uh, us to do is once we are done with the ESF one, two, and ARP, is to come back and review the budget the local budget request and make adjustments to that budget request based on what we've been able to invest in. So, you know, as you go down those, those line items, uh, what we can assure you is that we will provide a response to you to adjust any areas where we're able to, to fund okay. um, those items. So, so the answer, short answer is I, I think that we can definitely uh, demonstrate a, a, a significant investment okay. in the instructional materials as it pertains to textbooks, because textbooks is kind of a district mandate, right. uh, there are some challenges there with regard to being able to fund directly the textbooks, but we will have, a, again, a significant amount uh, invested in the types of materials that teachers will have in the classrooms uh, to support education going forward. And we'll, we'll clarify that in our amended request. Yes, uh, the reason why I'm asking this is because, as Mr. Santos mentioned earlier, the 20% of the ARP for the scientific data research to enhance learning or improve the learning because of COVID, I'm asking that, can this be utilized to purchase the textbooks because you didn't have, you, GDOE has always fallen behind of textbooks because the appropriation that we give ends up being used for operations. 
So I think you know these things happen, yeah. right? So this has been the natural uh, approach to things. So, um, to so if I make ask, to cover up oh, the shortfall, sorry. right? Yeah. And so that's just that's just what I'm wondering. I, I, I appreciate that you're going to readdress some of the mandates, um, but I'd like to discuss it, you know, for the record, so it shows that you know we are working together to look into these items. And so in regards to the textbooks, I believe you're going to say something, but you know, if this 20%, if the scientific research can pull through to show that GDOE needs textbooks and workbooks uh, for the students, for the face-to-face -face learning, or are we just going to continue on with utilizing our tablets or the uh, internet online resources for continued edu education for the upcoming school year? So I think this might be a good time. I want to ask Deputy Joe Sanchez. Um, I mean, I know you're asking a specific question, but I think there is even a broader answer when it comes to what we're able to do with these resources to support teachers in the classroom uh, as, it comes, as it pertains to teaching and learning and learning loss. Because I think there, there definitely a, it's, a, it's a significant investment that we're making, and it covers everything you're talking about, from instructional materials to supplies and equipment to technology. So I don't, uh, you know, Joe, if you could just give a flavor as to how that discussion's gone and what we're able to invest in. Sure, I think it's absolutely. exciting. I think it's exciting to report to our community and thank you for that opportunity. Sure, absolutely, thank you, thank you, sir, and thank you, Madam Chair. So uh, the answer is yes, we're going to be addressing uh, the instructional materials needs for all of our subject areas. In ESF1, we started with English language arts and math in ESF2, we extended to social studies and science. And now with the ARP, we're doing all of the college career readiness, uh, which are formerly called the electives. So the intent is to make sure that all teachers and students have a full complement of instructional resources. And the justification that we used is if you, if you note, when they talk about interventions, as you know, because I know you're a teacher, interventions are not effective if the core instruction is not effective first. So we spent a lot of money to make sure that the core instruction is supported. Daytime instruction, professional development, all of the technology that's uh, being provided is kind of the foundation of all those supports. Then on top of that, uh, it's the after school activities, the extended learning opportunities, the Saturday opportunities, the summer opportunities, and all schools are involved in that, in that design. With the ARP, we're really excited about what the ARP allows us to do because now if you look at ESF1 and ESF2, all the interventions and supports were in school. So in school activities, after school activities, in school, uh, during class, in the morning, things like that. The ARP is now actually allowing us to expand beyond the school. So we're looking at community-based organizations. We're looking at uh, GPD did a wonderful presentation to us um, a couple of days ago to our principals and we, were, we're, we wanted to link up with them because they have a lot of uh, activities that keep youth out of trouble. Uh, we know that there's a number of other organizations that have reached out and said, hey, we would like to help. Uh, they just don't have the resources. So that's where we would like to channel some of those ARP resources so that it's not just in-school interventions that are supported, but also what can be done at the community level. And that, and that solves a whole host of problems. Like for example, one big problem is transportation the kids trying to get to the school, or if they stay back for an after-school program, trying to get home. Even though busing is provided, it's still that, you know, it's still that kind of disincentive for a lot of kids. But if we were to have a combination of school-based plus activities that are close to their home, or in some cases, uh, their housing areas, because we did have some housing uh, developers reach out to us uh, to offer some of the spaces that they have. So uh, those are some of the plans that we have in place for that, that learning loss uh, challenges that we've noted. And, and Senator, if I may, I was really trying to give Joe an, also an opportunity to talk about, you know, those long lists of supply, the supply list that we give to the students. I don't think you oh, stressed yes. that enough. Can we get, yes. I wanted to give him an opportunity because that's really yeah. uh, actually something I think parents and so, teachers will appreciate. Yeah, a couple of years ago, uh, I, I'm sure you must have seen it. It's on Facebook. It's this meme where it shows uh, two pictures, a uh, government-funded classroom, which is kind of empty and just a green board, and then a teacher-funded classroom. A lot of people don't realize that that's, that's to a certain extent true. 
teachers spend hundreds of dollars on an annual basis just to decorate their classroom, you know, to put up materials, things like that. Our goal with this funding is to make sure that no student and no teacher has to pull out any funds to, to uh, have the classroom. So we've given an allocation to teachers, we've given the allocation to students. So that supply list that gets sent home every year, sometimes it adds up to like $60, $70 in some cases where the students have to purchase all these uh, supplies. We don't want students to have to do that for the next three years. Same thing with teachers, the allocation that they get, we don't want them to have to pull out of pocket uh, for the next three years. If we could extend that to four, well, we'll, <laughs> we, we'll do it. But based on the funding that we have available, it looks like the next three years uh, we'll be able to provide that support. And, and if, we may, if I may, one of the areas that we're also le leveraging with both our ESF1, ESF2, and the ARP, as well as, as well as our consolidated grant, we know many of our families are struggling. And with the mandate of uniforms, we now included in those grants uh, procurement of uniforms so that it does not have to lay or burdened with, with parents. If all we need to know is you, you, you need uniforms, we'll provide uniforms. We've even went out and reached out with the Foster uh, Institute Child Protective Services to help them uh, leverage uh, uniforms as well. We're even including washers and dryers in all of our schools to, and retrofitting the electrical and the sewer so that if a student doesn't have washer, uh, a washer or dryer, we can actually wash it in, in school and it's part of our outreach program. So we're really looking at all aspects to help the students, uh, especially those that are struggling. Thank you for that. I, I really appreciate the uh, out-of-the-box thinking and dedication you have for our community stakeholders and the children, um, especially providing the supplies and, and also the, um, the health pe uh, piece of it is ensuring the hygiene and the cleanliness, so thank you. I'll now offer the floor to Senator Shelton, the Vice Chair, if she has any questions and comments. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, for the, all the information today. Uh, on the note, uh, on the uniforms, washers, and dryers for stakeholder outreach, I wanted to mention here in this hearing that we recently uh, heard a bill from the Guam Youth Congress and the legislature on period poverty to mandate the schools have um, feminine hygiene supplies in the school. So I'm hoping that is something that you may include in your budget. Uh, to provide these things in our middle and high schools. If, if I may, yes. um, what we caution is that these ESF1, ESF2, as well as the ARP will be gone in the next two, three years. What will continue is the consolidated grant. So we caution the senators, if you mandate something, we won't be able to fund it. So we highly suggest that that would be a high suggestion, which we are including in our consolidated grant as, as, as part of our outreach activities for hygiene for both males and females. We're including that. As long as it's not mandated, we can be able to provide that through our consolidated grant and other funding sources. But once that is mandated, it's called supplanting. So we don't want to violate that federal requirement, supplant versus supplement. So, uh, please be cautious with that. I know that uh, the Youth Congress is, is, has good ideas, but once you mandate something and it goes to the legislature, the legislature must now fund it and no longer will be the responsibility of the grant itself. I understand. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Santos. Okay. On the uh, subject of the ARP funding, uh, I know you mentioned that we have three years to utilize these funds. And I'm wondering if you can share with us the major capital improvement projects that you're including in this budget uh, so we know how big these projects are and how realistic it's going to be to complete them within the funding time. Uh, how confident are we uh, that we can get these big projects done? Um, I, I guess what I would ask if we, if, you know, I think we definitely are being ambitious in our, in our uh, proposals. So, but I, until we sort through them and finalize the application and debate, you know, how we are able to prioritize and justify these, I would probably not want to put out a list, but I will let you know that, you know, all of, that we're, we're beyond 
just the restroom renovations. I mean, that's an important aspect. We are trying to do that in ESF too. So now we're thinking more about what's needed at the, at the school level to address other areas of need that are relative to, that are relevant to bring students back. So definitely ventilation you know, has been the top priority. And uh, even as we look at filtration, we're also looking at the, the you know, you've, you're familiar with the history of our ventilation needs. So definitely that's a, that's a major component. Uh, we talk about a, lot, a lot about the canopy repairs that uh, exist throughout the district. And you know, so any areas outside that could use support for physical distancing. So we're looking at all those um, as well. Um, we are looking at the, um, the um, you know, the, uh, so I would say social emotional wellness as it pertains to some of the activities, but that also, you know, pertains to uh, some of the physical education classes, the health classes, the gyms, you know, and so there, there are a, a, a wide list. I, we, I would hate to give a list now though until we're finalized because what happens is stakeholders get excited and then when we say it's not allowable, it might be an issue, but again, May 21st is our target date for finalizing and, submis and submission to USDOE so that by that time, uh, I, will, I and all of our stakeholders will have a chance to say these are the, what we want to see funded. We'll give our federal programs team an opportunity to say, look, you know, this is going to not be probably able to be justified, but all these are. And once we sort that out, we'll be happy to, uh, you know, provide a, a very specific list. But just trust me, we're being ambitious because this really is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to address many unmet needs. So when it, whether it's from UPI all the way down to Southern High to Maritza Elementary, we're looking at, you know, what we can do with the funds based on their uses. Now, from a capacity standpoint, I think... Uh, I mentioned uh, in our, and we did in our testimony that we are looking for construction management services and we are you know, looking at the capacity needed to carry this out. So that is an ongoing uh, uh, you know, effort uh, within our department to try to shore up and make sure that we have the capacity to um, uh, carry out the proposals. Um, I think as part of the prioritization, if we do have projects that say they're just not doable within the the expenditure time frame, then those probably will end up falling off the list. Uh, so that might take care of itself. But even just to carry out the three years of, pro of feasible projects, you know, we were not set up um, to address this amount of resources. So we are working with the board, with the you know, with our federal programs team, with our our business side and our local side, to uh, try to figure out uh, how to shore up that capacity so that we're ready to go when those. Uh, projects start to uh, you know, begin moving. So construction management, we're looking at, at you know, having the planning capacity built in and so forth. Um, and then one more aspect on the CIP funds. Uh, as you know, this is kind of dovetailing. We've got a lot of our school-based requests for CIP. You know, we, um, you know, we have, of course, we have projects that have been identified in our local budget request that are things that we're gonna try to cover and try to fund. But we also have a master facilities plan that's underway right now, so there will be additional information that will be coming that could impact uh, how we uh, prioritize those funds. So this month we're expecting, you know, it's, it's May, so I believe next week we're expecting the arrival of engineers um, on behalf of the U.S. Army Corps and um, our planners to come and up, up, update their assessment of the deferred maintenance in our schools. Back in 2013, you're very familiar, because you were involved in getting that support. Uh, they went building by building and gave us a $90 million deferred maintenance price tag, which helped guide some of the ARA spending. So we expect that something similar to that when they do their building by building assessment uh, in May, so that over the summer, uh, maybe that, some of that information will help uh, augment uh, our use of um, the, the available funds. Okay, so we will look forward to your uh your list and your application being approved and uh, that review from the U.S. Army Corps uh, very soon. Uh, thank you for that answer. Uh, and I also wanted to ask about um, the ARP funding. I know that it will be distributed to the charter schools and the private schools based on the amount of students. Uh, a few minutes ago before you all walked in here, we had the charter schools here and of course, um, the Career Tech High School shared that they were ineligible to receive any federal fundings from the last rounds. And now that they have been open, 
uh, with students enrolled, will they be able to use uh, their number of students uh, as a basis to apply for these funds? How the regulation how the regulation works with regards to receiving uh, federal grants is that the institution must not only uh, exist but must be registered with the revenue and taxation as a nonprofit organization but must be in existence for one full year. I see. And then from there we will go out and visit the school site, get a copy of their student enrollment, monitor to ensure that it's in the class and their we will look at student numbers to see that the student numbers do not duplicate the public schools, student enrollment, and then there's a process that we provide technical assistance to that institution. So that institution that uh, you mentioned, we have been in communication. They've sat in in one of our sessions, our technical assistance, just, to be, just so that they are prepared when they, when they meet those requirements. They must be in existence for one school year, and they must also meet the requirements that they are registered as a nonprofit organization and registered with the Rev Department of Revenue and Taxation. So those are requirements, and so we have been working with them. Thank you very much for that explanation. Uh, of course, they, as everyone, every school on Guam, we were not prepared to uh, be equipped for a pandemic to change our uh, different protocols in the schools, and so. Uh, during their opening, they, they also face the same challenges. It's unfortunate that their opening was in the middle of all of this, but uh, hopefully as they reach their one year anniversary, they'll be able to avail of some kind of uh, assistance down the line. And, I appreciate that and answer. And for the record, CIFA is yes. one of them that we are now providing not just our consolidated grant services, but also ESF-1, ESF-2, and the American Rescue Plan. Mm -hmm. So CIFA is one of the three, one of three uh, charter schools that are entitled to receive those funding okay. for and, services. All right, thank you very much. For the ESF-2, I know you mentioned that uh, the private schools and the charter schools are amending their applications and so do they have a timeline for those amendments and uh, is there anything that needs to be expedited to ensure that there's no missing out on these funds for them? We gave them last week and in fact uh, I have a two o'clock meeting with uh, Dr. Wampat uh, with regards to her concerns and so we'll be meeting with her and so Although we asked for specific timelines as of last week, as timing is of the essence to expand and determine where they're at and to determine allowable uses, uh, we're given the flexibility to try to work with them and try to be as creative uh, to ensure that what they, uh, what they wish to use those funds are rebudgeted to meet the requirements. For example, uh, one charter school had said, can we use some of those funds for uh, our summer school, summer program. We said yes, so they're going to uh, put more money into their, into their budget to support their summer school program. Others want to increase the number of, of uh, uh, supplies, uh, PPE supplies and materials that they were to, or laptops. And then there's others that says we just, we're just overwhelmed with the, uh, the numbers of supplies and materials that we are receiving that we no longer wish to participate. But we caution the private non-public schools that if they're using federal funds to support their summer school activity, they cannot charge students. And if they do, those monies need to be um, documented and be used as program income. And it's, it's incumbent on the federal programs to review and they have to report that so that we can be able to uh, determine uh, how much they made uh, based on charging students and ensuring those funds are used appropriately based on regulation. Thank, thank you very much for that. And uh, it sounds like you have many intricacies and different rules to follow, so I'm glad that you're all on top of that. And uh, the charter schools did share with us this morning how pleased they are with the relationships they've been able to build with the department and how supportive you've all been of them. So I thank you for your partnership and the work that you're doing to support uh, schools outside of uh, DOE. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity. Thank you. And I'd like to thank, unless there's nothing, if there's nothing else that the Guam Department of Education would like to present, um, I'd like to go ahead and proceed to close this informational hearing. Okay. So I, first I want to thank all of you for coming here today. This is our first face-to-face -face informational hearing. 
and I'd like to thank the level of transparency that you have always provided this committee and the people of Guam and the outstanding work that GDOE and all of its members have done and parents and stakeholders during this transition and of the pandemic. Um, it, it was really an enormous feat to accomplish. Um, you guys went out and provided services for, for the food um, commodities. You provided uh, a change in the curriculum patterns and different types of mediums that were, that were being utilized. And I know the schools worked very hard to create those, um, the instruction packets for the parents who did not elect for online learning. And I know it was tedious and I know it was time consuming. So I'd like to thank all the members at the schools too for their hard work. And also to make this transition into online learning, uh, educating the parents on how to navigate through the platform that was being utilized within all the different various schools and the different types of curriculum. Mr. Sanchez, great work to your team and to everyone that, um, that implemented this system. And so, you know, I, I cannot stress enough the, the uh, great success that your, your team has brought uh, for the community, Mr. Superintendent. And um, I, I, uh, I congratulate you and GDOE. And I know you want to say something. So. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate it. Thank you for recognizing the hard work of, I mean, all, all the employees who are not here today. I mean, it definitely is a lot going on. And, and every day it's, uh, it does feel overwhelming because there's so many things going on and we're already looking ahead to next year, but you're absolutely right that, it, that all of this goes right into the classroom. The teachers and the staff uh, feel it too. So we're walking through all the schools and we have these conversations and everybody knows it's been, you know, been, been a tough haul. Uh, but I just, I wanna let you know that, you know, we do, uh, we are very focused on, on where we're heading with all this. So not just the investment of these funds, but what the purpose is of these funds and the purpose that we have at the Guam Education Board and the department is to return our kids as much as possible to as normal a possible a school year. Now we know we're never gonna get back to that, but next year, you know, we're working hard to maximize the number of kids who can come back face to face for five days of instruction and just trying to plan for that and make all the adjustments. Uh, we know there are a lot of people who are interested and wanna hear you know, more about those specifics. But that's our goal for next year, trying to bring the students who are registered. And we have about 85% of our students uh, expecting to come back face to face uh, under the safety parameters that are in place. And we're trying to make sure we maximize instructional time and then also make sure we address the impact of COVID-19, that, that the impact that, that's, that's been felt by these kids uh, over the past year and a half. So uh, wish us luck on that. And we we're thank you, thankful for your partnership and and support. Um, that'll be our main effort as we close out this school year, turn right around to making sure we're ready, our schools are ready to receive students. Uh, and, and again, the only thing I can say in addition to that is that when you see our kids back, you know, in the classroom, you'll see uh, that that's where they need to be. I've been able to observe uh, the kids are happy to be, be, be back with their classmates and teachers. And we hope the community stays safe so we can see more of that when the, in the coming school year. So thank you very much again for your support. Thank you, Mr. Superintendent. And, and hopefully maybe we can utilize some of the ARP funding to get the Chief Brody Memorial School uh, up and operational right for the next school year. Um, so yeah, so thank you very much for everyone at GDOE for all their hard work, um, from our maintenance, our custodial, our, our teachers and our staff, thank you so much for all the hard work they do, especially our guidance counselors who have done a, a tremendous effort uh, dealing with the complexities of uh, mental health during this COVID and uh, all the social workers that, as well going out and uh, assisting for the pandemic and going into the homes. So thank you very much. We will now conclude this informational hearing. It is now 12.07 in the uh, afternoon. Have a good lunch and God bless you guys. Thank you.